That was pretty, wasn't it? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Brushing Fort Baptist Church. We're excited uh, that you've chosen to worship with us, and we look forward to, to worshiping the Lord together. And uh, we look forward to uh, worshiping and, and fellowshipping with one another. Uh, this morning, our call to worship is Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of uh, faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness and the planting of the Lord, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks, foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of, your, their, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, and their descendants in the midst of the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a uh, beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to, to sprout up before all the nations. Isaiah 61 is a promise from the Lord. Uh, it is a prophecy from Isaiah. It tells us what it's going to be like in the blessings of, of God's uh, new heavens and new earth. Uh, it gives us the promise of, of Israel being re reclaimed. Uh, and it, it shares these blessings uh, with us. Especially at the very beginning. We see that uh, the Messiah is going to do great and marvelous things. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, me to bring news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Uh, the Messiah, who we know as Jesus, is the one who gives liberty to us. As we look at our identities, we have to come to grips with the fact that Jesus is the only one who can give us freedom uh, in our uh, spiritual uh, lives. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this promise out of Isaiah 61. Lord, all of these uh, promises that you have given us. Lord, that uh, in your kingdom, uh, there will be no, uh, Lord, there will be no uh, sin and uh, interpersonal struggles. Lord, that uh, our struggles will be turned into blessings. And Lord, that uh, we will live in uh, peace and harmony. Uh, and Lord, that the picture that you have given us in Isaiah 61 is such a, a great and marvelous picture for us. I pray that you would open our hearts to these truths. Lord, as we sing praises to you, that you would lift our hearts and encourage us. And Lord, that we would be an encouragement to those around us. Lord, that... Uh, you will uh, do a great work in our hearts through the thoughts, through the songs we sing, and through the uh, prayers that we pray. And Lord, uh, through your word, as your spirit ministers to us. Lord, we just thank you uh, for that. Be with us this morning. Uh, guide and direct us. I pray that your spirit would uh, move in us. And Lord, I pray that we would be more like Jesus when we leave than when we came in because of the work that you have done in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We will be in uh, verse 16 through chapter 6, verse 2 uh, this morning, and also looking at a uh, couple other uh, passages uh, this morning. As we think about uh, a new creation in Christ, uh, we are definitely entering into uh, winter weather, aren't we? Uh, the, the cold has come. In fact, the, the snow was falling as we were walking up the, the ramp this morning. But uh, as we think about this new creation, we are entering the, the cold and, and uh, dormant phase of creation. But uh, the spring comes and uh, then the, the flowers start shooting up and, and things start greening up and, and life seems to bloom, Right. Well, here in 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul is talking about this transition that we have from, from the dead self, from what happens in Genesis chapter 3 and after when Adam and Eve sin and, and uh, their, uh, their relationship is broken with Christ, their, their spiritual life is dead. And now Christ has come and he's offering that new life, a new a uh, person, a uh, res restoration of our identities. Uh, in a very real way, uh, Christ is offering a rebirth, just like in the spring, when the, when the ground wakes up and uh, all the plants start budding and different things. In a very similar way, Jesus is offering us new life. So we need to look at this and recognize uh, what it means for our identity. As, we, as we've looked at our identity, we've seen that God had a purpose for us. As human beings, God had a purpose. And we've looked at the idolatry that distracts us. We've looked at how that, uh, uh, those idolatries, uh, they, bring, they take us away from God's plan and his purpose. We've looked at materialism. We've looked at, at sexual idolatry. And we've looked at... Uh, uh, entertainment. Uh, but this morning, I want us to see that we are new creations in Christ. So I want us to boil all of what we've uh, read and seen down and see what the New Testament has to say about what it means uh, to have a new identity in Christ. We are a new creation. So let's read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. From now on, Therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ. Uh, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors with Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favor favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this word. Lord, we thank you for... Uh, the truth that is here, Lord, that that you have bridged the gap, Lord, that that the fall in Adam and Eve, uh, that relationship was severed. But Lord, through the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see that you are work at restoring that relationship. You have provided a bridge by which we can have this relationship stored, restored, and that bridge is. Now, the person of Jesus Christ, he is the one who reconciles us 
to our creator. He's the one who restores the purpose for which we are created. He's the one who offers liberty. He's the one who offers us adoption uh, from the Father. Lord, we thank you for those magnificent truths. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would teach us these things this morning. Lord, that we would see that our identity doesn't have to be wrapped up in all of these idolatries. But Lord, we can wrap up our identity and we can live in such a way that our identity is uh, restored to what you intended from the very beginning. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, the, the big idea from this passage is that we need to find our identity by grounding it in a relationship with Jesus. We need to find our identity by grounding it in a relationship with Jesus. Uh, it, the title of the sermon series is Identity, Who We Are. Uh, for us to know exactly who we are, we need to know who we are in the person of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, or uh, 2 Corinthians 2, uh, shows us this, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, shows us this, and we need to realize from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we need to find our purpose and identity in Christ. So, to do that, what do we do? From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. What is Paul talking about here? Uh, in, the, uh, in the context of the 2 Corinthians, uh, he is dealing with uh, a church that has had people that have come in and said, we knew Jesus, we encountered Jesus, whether that was a post-resurrection experience like Paul, or whether that was a pre-resurrection experience where, where they were with uh, the crowds that had walked with Jesus through uh, the, the area of Israel, whether the northern part or the southern part of the kingdom, uh, through his ministry there. Uh, these people had come in and says, we know Jesus and we have a word from God. And then they would repeat that word and it would be different from what the apostles had called them to. And Paul is writing this letter to remind them that, that the gospel once received from, uh, from Jesus and his apostolic uh, appointed uh, speakers was what they needed to follow. And here they are saying, Paul is telling the church, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. What is he talking about? Well, these apostles were proclaiming the fact that, that they had seen Jesus and, and they were proclaiming the, fact, the, the benefit of their good preaching and, and their charismatic personalities. And everything that looked good from the outside is what they were talking about. And Paul here is saying that we shouldn't be concerned with what uh, people have on the outside. No, that doesn't mean that we just throw it aside. But our main concern isn't what people show us on the outside. Because Jesus, or because uh, Paul looked at the story of Jesus and he realized that the Jews and even Paul himself looked on the outside of Jesus and they misunderstood what he was all about. That's why Paul is saying, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, as we preach through Luke, we saw that this was a constant frame. The, the, the Jews were, were uh, looking at their own expectations, their own understanding of what the Bible had said, and Jesus didn't meet those expectations, and they were considering him according to the flesh. But, G, or, but God had a different plan for his son, didn't he? So here Paul is telling them, don't regard Jesus according to the flesh. So how do we, what do we do? If we aren't to take someone uh, on face value according to the flesh, what do we need to do? Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul is telling the church of Corinth. 
That our old identities that were steeped in the fall and in the consequences of Adam and Eve's choice in Genesis chapter 3, that old man, Paul says, there is now a new way, a bridge by which God is building back that relationship. We saw from the very beginning that God's intent was to, to be in the presence of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And as they had children for that garden to expand, they would bring dominion further and further and further out. And God would dwell with his people. God would dwell with humanity in that place that he had provided for them. Their identity was wrapped up in the purpose for which they were created. They were made in the image and the likeness of God. They were to bring dominion and they were to show the world who God was as his earthly representatives. But Genesis chapter 3 happened. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They fell. Sin entered the world. And that relationship, that, that purpose wasn't completely destroyed, but it was certainly uh, hindered, wasn't it? That relationship was broken. Now, Adam and Eve... They are outside of the Garden of Eden. God has placed the, the angels there to protect uh, the tree of life so that they wouldn't live forever in their sins. God has a purpose, and, and that purpose has been uh, affected by Genesis chapter 3, but, but God still desires for Adam and Eve uh, to bring dominion and to be representatives of him. The problem is that relationship is broken. The, the purpose for which they were created has been broken. And now Paul is saying through the person of Jesus Christ, that broken relationship can be restored. Paul says that old man that we were in, in the death of, of sin of Adam and Eve, now Christ has come and we have the opportunity for the new creation. So if we believe in Jesus, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Paul is saying that that relationship, that purpose can be restored in the purpose of Christ. We can have new identities in Jesus. In fact, our identities can be restored to what God intended from the very beginning. In Jesus, we can have dominion. In Jesus, we can be the likeness and we can be the, the image bearers of God. And we can proclaim this to a lost and dying world. And how do we know that? Because Paul goes on and says in verse 18, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. How do we know that, that Paul is talking about this relationship that was broken? Because immediately after he says we are a new creation, not the old men, but the new person that God has intended, he then explains to us how this happens. It happens through the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus died in our place. And God placed our sins on Jesus, and he judged our sins on Jesus on the cross. And then God did something remarkable. That's pretty remarkable, but then God did something remarkable. He took Jesus' perfect record, and he placed that on our account. That relationship has been healed. If we place our faith in Jesus that relationship has been healed and is done through the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what does that look like? That's pretty remarkable news, isn't it? That should get us excited that, that the purpose for which God created us, he has restored and healed us. He's made a way for us to fulfill that. How does that happen? Well, if we turn back to Isaiah 61, which we read we realize that all, not only do we need to find our purpose and identity in Christ, but we need to experience the freedom found in Christ. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are, brave, who are bound. 
Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. You see, in this part of Isaiah, Isaiah is looking forward to what the Messiah is going to bring. Uh, from, from chapters 40 to, to chapter 66, we have Isaiah giving a vision of what the new heavens and the new earth is going to be. What God is going to do to restore this relationship with his people. This is all the promises that he set out. And, and Isaiah 61 is at the pinnacle of this. And at the pinnacle of that, Jesus is, is going to have a ministry of reconciliation that will set captives free. As Americans, we're all about freedom, aren't we? In fact, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't turn on the television these days and not have a discussion about freedom, right? With, with all the vaccine mandates and all the uh, different things that come and surround that, there's a constant discussion about freedom. We're thankful that we live in the most free place that has ever been in all of uh, the history of the world. But America pales in comparison to the freedom that God wants to give us in the person of Jesus Christ. The freedom that, that God wants to give us in the person of Jesus Christ is, is way beyond the freedom that we encounter as American citizens. What does God want to do? How does, he want to, uh, how does he want to liberate the captives? How does he want to bring liberty to those who are captives? He's talking about this captivity to sin. We as, as people uh, born of Adam and Eve in that, in that lineage, we are captive and born into sin. And that sin is all-encompassing. It leads to idolatry, which is what we've been studying for the last several weeks. And, and all of those idolatries and even the ones that we haven't mentioned. All of those things are a result of the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Romans tells us that very clearly. But here, uh, Isaiah is telling us that, that the Messiah has come to give liberty to captives. What does that mean? God wants to free us from the dominion of that sin. He wants to free us from that dominion so that we can bring dominion to this earth. So his kingdom can be set up. God wants us to fulfill the purpose for which he has created us. And he does that through the person of Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in Jesus, when we believe that he did exactly what he said he did and that he's accomplished what he has come to accomplish, when we place our faith in him and we believe in him and we repent of our sins and follow him, then now we have a restored relationship. But not only that, we now are a new creation that is freed from the bondage of sin. Our identities have drastically been changed. We are not wrapped up in that old man who is wrapped up in the idolatry of a sinful nature, but we now are free to live in Christ. Does that mean we do it every day? No, we still live in a fallen world, don't we? But one day we will be freed from that fallen world. We will live the righteous life that God has called us to. He will, he will glorify us uh, when that trumpet sounds and he descends and he sets up his kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. We will know freedom. But God isn't just talking about that day in heaven. God is not talking about that day in the new heavens and the new earth. He's talking about our relationship now. God wants us to realize that even though we haven't experienced everything and every promise of the kingdom, that we can still have liberty in the here and now. What does that liberty look like? What does that liberty mean to us? Well, let's look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Not only do we need to find our purpose and identity in Christ, and not only do we need to experience the freedom found in Christ, but we need to live in the peace with God found in Christ. Look at this in Romans chapter 5. 
Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and while that we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him. From the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled. Shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So, not only uh, do we have freedom, but we also have peace. With God. God's or Jesus' death on our behalf and that relationship that He has given, our identity is not just bound up in liberty, but it's also bound up in peace. And, and uh, Paul is not just talking about peace from this world. In fact, we know that because right after he says that we have peace, what does he tell them? He tells them uh, there's going to be suffering. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Paul, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of peace. Knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What does Paul mean by this hope here? What does he mean by this peace with God? It's not that we're not going to face any trials on this earth. It's not that we're going to go not going to go through hard times. But it's that we can have a confidence that that relationship with God has been restored. And no longer are we in danger of his judgment. And that brings peace. That means peace because there's no more anxiety about uh, God's judgment hanging and looming over our heads. God has, has uh, placed that judgment on the back of Jesus Christ on that old rugged cross. And that sin debt has been paid. And now if we are found in Christ, if we have that relationship with Jesus, then we can have the peace that passes understanding. We can have that restored relationship. How does it come? He tells us this in verse 11. It comes by receiving the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus came to set the captives free. Jesus also came to bring us peace with God. What a glorious promise. Um, Paul had just get, got done saying in, in Romans chapter 4 the, the, the battle between law and sin. And, and here in Romans chapter 7, he's going to continue with that, with that. And we recognize that we still are people that, that struggle on this earth. We struggle between that, that, uh, the fact that this world has fallen and, and that we still live in fallen bodies and and we are affected by the fall still. We are still subject to sin. But Paul says there is a reality, there is an identity that transcends that battle. And we receive that through a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus liberates us from the penalty of that sin. And he gives us peace that that relationship with God is whole and fulfilled. We can live in peace with God found in Christ. But not only that. Paul tells us in Romans uh, chapter 8. <clears throat> 
Romans chapter 8 tells us that not only do we live in peace with God found in Christ, but we live for the inheritance of Jesus found in Christ. Romans chapter 8 says, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the, the liberty. That's the, the freedom from judgment. No longer do we have to fear the judgment of God for those who are in Christ. In verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free, free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Here, Paul places or puts it plainly. We are free in our relationship in Christ, with Christ. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life. And peace. What does Paul mean in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he says that we don't look at Jesus uh, in the flesh? We don't look at each other in the flesh? This is what he means. He says that our minds, if they're set on the spirit, we see spiritual things and are led to life. But if we set our minds on fleshly things, we are led astray and led to death. In verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. And then he says in verse 12, so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What does this mean? Not only has God given us liberty, not only has he given us peace, but he has given us the ministry of adoption. We were people who were orphaned in our sins. That relationship was broken. There's not more uh, broken a relationship than the relationship that is broken by death, is there? We were orphaned in our lives. We had, we had no spiritual uh, mother or father, and here God has adopted us into the family. He has uh, sent his son to pay that debt. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation and we now are brought into the family of God. God wants to give us liberty. God wants to give us peace, but he wants to give us a new family. He wants to restore the purpose for which he created us. He wants to, to restore that, that image that was, that was broken. He wants to uh, if we, if we think about uh, the fact that we are his image bearers, we were a mirror that was supposed to reflect him to the world. And in the fall, that mirror was crushed and broken. It hadn't, all the pains hadn't fallen out, but just think of a broken mirror. It doesn't give the same image, does it? But here, Christ has brought us into a ministry of adoption. He set us free. He's given us peace. He brought us into that ministry of adoption and he has restored that mirror. And to the point where we as his children can call out Abba, Father. He is our Father. But not only that, 
He's given us liberty. He's given us peace. He's given us the ministry of adoption. But he has promised us an inheritance. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Paul says, if we follow Jesus, if we seek after him, then we will find the treasure that the man stubbed his toe on in Matthew chapter 13. Saw that the treasure was worth more than he could even imagine, went and sold all of his possessions so that he could buy that piece of property, and he had the treasure, he possessed the treasure, that we are heirs with Jesus. If we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then our wealth is uncountable. Jesus is our joint heir. So what does this mean? We have liberty in Jesus. We have peace with God in Jesus. We have the ministry of adoption and he has provided us as heirs of his kingdom. What does that mean for our identity? If we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we know the ministry of reconciliation. We know the purpose for which God has for us. Our identity is not wrapped up in all of the, the idols that we've discussed and all the idols that the Bible discusses. Uh, uh, we are a new creation. We are no longer enslaved to that idolatry, but now we have that restored relationship where we can worship God in a pure heart, with a pure mind. In a restored relationship. Because he has set us free. He has given us peace with him. He has adopted us into his family. He has given us an inheritance. That means that our identity in Christ. Changes forever. Who we are. No longer do we pursue the lies of idolatry. But we pursue our identity in the liberty and peace and adoption and heirship of Jesus. But God has a plan for us here on this earth. Not only are we to enjoy that change of identity, but he tells us not only that, that we have received the ministry of reconciliation, but we are to be ministers of reconciliation. In verse 19, that is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be re reconciled to God. Paul is telling the church of Corinth that he has a ministry of reconciliation that God had given him and that they have a ministry of reconciliation. They, they recognize, they are, Paul is calling them to understand their new identity in Christ, the freedom that they have. And not only that, he's telling them that they have a duty to go and share that with those around them. In fact, he, he finishes this in, in chapter 6. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul is saying that today is the day that you can receive Jesus. Paul is saying today is the day that you can receive his identity. Today is the day that you can have your new identity. Not only do we realize that, uh, that this relationship comes by Jesus, but it can come today. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Paul tells us that today is the day of salvation. 
If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, recognize the gift that you have been given. You've been given a new identity. You are a new creation. You have been given the liberty of Isaiah 61. You have been given the peace of Romans 5. You've been given the adoption of Romans chapter 8 and the heirship that is again mentioned in Romans chapter 8. This is all our inheritance through the person and work of of Jesus. It only happens through him. And our job as Christ followers, our job as Christians, is to take that message of the good news of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ and take it to those who haven't believed. We are ambassadors of that ministry of reconciliation. We have experienced it and we are to share that ministry with others. I hope that this is an encouragement to you. I hope that you see that your identity is forever changed in Jesus. But I also hope that it is an encouragement to you. That when we get sidetracked, when the idols of this world start calling our attention, that we recognize that we are not slaves to them, but we are slaves to Jesus. We are bound to follow him and what he seeks to give is far greater than anything that we can find in the world jesus truly will change our identity he will give us the abundant life if we'll place our faith in him and follow him let's pray father we thank you for your word lord we thank you for uh, these truths from scripture I pray, Lord, that, that you would be with us, and Lord, that we would uh, that our identity would be wrapped up in Jesus, and Lord, that we would see that our new identity in Christ and the blessings of that. Lord, that we don't have to be uh, wrapped up in the idols of this world. Lord, that you have created us for a relationship, and you want us to be uh, in that relationship and healthy in that relationship. And Lord, we need to seek you as, as you uh, minister to us through your spirit. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, that they would come to know you. And Lord, that they would, they would receive the new identity that you have for them in Jesus. I pray, Lord, that that would be the cry of our heart. For those of us who know you, I pray, Lord, that we would take comfort in the fact that we are new in Christ. We are not slaves to the old man, but, Lord, that you have set us free. You have given us peace with God, and you have adopted us into his family. And, Lord, you have given us a ministry of uh, being your likeness in your image to a lost and dying world, calling them to repentance because you are a minister of reconciliation. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. If you feel like the Lord is leading you to have a personal relationship with him, then let me just share with you the best news. To share with you the best news, I have to share with you the bad news. The bad news is that we are sinners uh, and we fall short of the glory of God. Paul tells us, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That means that that relationship in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that Adam and Eve had, that they had, were in relationship with God, that means that our sins break that relationship. Just like Adam and Eve rebelled against God, we are sinners too and we rebel against God and that relationship is broken. That's bad news, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is we can't fix that relationship. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That means uh, the, what we have earned by our sin is death, and we can't change that. That's depressing. That's hard. But God doesn't leave us there. Thankfully, He gives us good news, even amongst this bad news and the worst news. God gives us good news, and the good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus came. He died on an old rugged cross. He, was, he lived the perfect life that God called us to. He died on our behalf. And, and Jesus offers us the free gift of eternal life. He offers us salvation. 
That's the good news. But the best news is that Jesus' offer can be applied on our account. We can know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We can have that relationship restored. How do we do that? We do that by faith. Faith is an odd word, but it simply means trust. I'm trusting that the seat that I'm sitting in is going to keep me off the floor. We have to place our faith. We have to trust that Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he said he did. We have to trust that. And we have to trust that he will honor his promises, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We express that oftentimes by praying. So if you'd like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to pray a prayer uh, something like this, where you uh, tell God that you recognize that you are a sinner and that your sins have separated and broken that relationship with him and to tell him that you're sorry and and to realize that Jesus uh, came to be the answer. He came to, to die and to live the perfect life and to die in your place. And that you are accepting, you believe that Jesus did that. And you want his death to be applied to your account. You want the forgiveness of your sins. And you want to follow Jesus in obedience the rest of your life. If you've made that decision, would you reach out to us? Would you email us at info at brushyforkbaptist.com or contact us on Facebook? We'd love to hear that you've made a, a commitment to follow the Lord. God bless.